Uh, all right, let me make sure everything is set up. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, so the title of this talk is Initiation into Audits, the what and when of started starting. But uh, I think it makes sense to start with the reason for this talk, which is I was talking to a few people and, and each of these person kind of had the same question. Like they were new people, people that are new into the space. Um, <clears throat> And they learned some things about security. Uh, they did some CTFs, but then essentially they were kind of at a loss where they should start when they did like a security engagement or like bug bounties or an audit. Um, so like they all had the question like, oh shit, where, where do I actually start? Um, and I was like, oh yeah. I, I don't know, let, let me think about it. And I looked at how I kind of approach things, but then I also asked like the, the auditors at Contenses Diligence and outside of Contenses Diligence as well, uh, after I, I did this talk uh, at a conference um, to see like what are kind of the the different strategies that, that people follow. And this talk is kind of a what I learned from from those those people, like how they they start their their audits. Um, and for most things, there for most situations, uh, there is this thing called the pre audit. Well, usually people don't call it a pre audit, actually. But before an audit, there's usually this thing where people do what they call scoping. So they figure out um like how much time they're going to need to deliver some some amount of real value to their customer uh this might be done by you as an auditor but might be done by different people so for example if you participate in a code arena contest or auditing contest then you're not really doing the scoping yourself uh, but you're leaving it uh, to someone else to set like the timelines um of of the audit but uh, in a sense, you're still also doing scoping yourself because you're kind of assessing how much time you're going to be able to spend on something and uh, whether that's going to be enough to come up with like any real results. The goal, like the key goal of scoping is not to, not really related to security, but it's more related to figuring out and making sure that you have enough time that you're not left at a loss, um, like they, that you don't go over scope in terms of time. But to be honest, um, I haven't met an auditor that likes scoping. So let's not spend too much time on it and go right into the audit. So overall, I've identified three like common uh, threads or, or strategies among the people that I asked. And they are like summed up in this slide. They are code first, tools and diagrams first, or documentation first. And over the rest of this presentation, uh, I'm going to go into each of them. And then afterwards, I'm going to look at why those strategies might be effective. Why it is that people do what they do? All right. So some people uh, are savages, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> they go for code first. Like they skip documentation. They don't read the website. They don't run any tools. They just go straight for the code and browse around, typically for a day. Um, there is a very, very extreme variant of this. And I have met many people that do this, but uh, it exists. So there's... Uh, they called it blind auditing. Um, they refused to look at anything but the code for the first day or two. Uh, and uh, they would like go through and build a mental model of the system and figure out how everything fits together based just on the code. And the reasoning behind this was um, was the was bias. Uh, one thing that's really easy to do and I've had this problem myself is uh, you trust documentation. Um, 
and documentation is almost never completely right so it's really easy to assume oh well uh, I don't like this is probably secure because this other part of the code makes sure that X is true. Um, well, if you start with the code and just the code, you don't run the risk of assuming that the documentation is true because you haven't read it at all. But even though people started with reading the code, they didn't start like going through things line by line. They they actually had a, a, a structured approach. Mm, structured isn't the right word, but they had an approach where they go through all of the contracts in the code base and they figure out the high level patterns. Like they figure out how things fit together, which contracts hold value, how do they connect to each other, which call a contract calls which other contract, where is all the interesting logic and which logic is like boilerplate stuff, ERC20. I don't have to look at this. And at the end, they have a pretty good sense of how the system fits together, just looking at the code. Then once they've done this, they'll go in and go line by line and figure everything out. But at first, like the goal for them, even though they start with the code, is to build a high level model. Um, yeah. Now, the second method is tools and diagrams. Um, and um, yeah, these people just start by running a whole bunch of tools on the code base. But the thing that you might find surprising here is that they didn't run vulnerability detection tools per se. They, well, they used tools like Slither, for example, but they didn't necessarily use it for finding vulnerabilities. They use the printers. So uh, there's a few tools I listed on this slide that have that are used a lot by auditors. And all of them, what they do is they provide you. So some of them are v VS Code extensions. Some of them are command line tools. All of them, what they allow you to do is kind of print overviews of the system, make models of the system, create pretty understandable things that allow you to think about a system on a high level. So here's an example output of the VS Code Visual, Solidity Visual Developer uh, report that shows like different statistics. Um, like there's a lot of comments in this code base, apparently. Um, this is another output. I, I believe it's um, Surya on um, that prints a dependency graph of the code base. And again, this method, the goal or like what the auditors pursued by using the tools is they built a mental model. They figured out what contracts were interesting, which contracts handle the money flows and or store the money, uh, if there's any money that's stored, and they figure out how the system fits together. For like graphs like these are immensely useful in seeing what the intended functionality of a particular class is, or to figure out how a system is supposed to work together. And diagrams are like, the key part of this. This is kind of the the quintessential tool. Um, it's not even a tool. It's like you can do this manually. So there's different types of diagrams that people use, and uh, we have some. Or in the diligence team, there there's a few people that build huge class diagrams when they do audits. So this is one example. Um, I'm not really sure of which code base this is anymore, but this shows a huge overview of all the different classes and how they relate to each other. So some classes store like pointers to other ones. And the funny thing is, and this is one of the things I heard about multiple auditors that followed this strategy, like they started out doing diagrams, both with tools and manually, that um, the diagrams that they built to understand the system during an audit are usually so good and useful that the de developers kind of borrow them for their own documentation. So there's quite a few diligence clients and, and clients from other auditing companies that, that have some audit artifacts that they used in their documentation, which is kind of cool, I think. <laughs> 
Um, so it's not just useful for audits, but uh, yeah. So finally, there's the documentation first approach. And this is the one I personally uh, tend to follow. Uh, and like I start usually with reading the high level developer docs and, and like I figure out what it is that developers are trying to do with the system and how it fits together. Um, what's nice about this is that it's like the, in terms of like mental bandwidth, documentation is much better than code. Like you do get that little bit of bias, but I feel like, um, it's easier to to get things across uh, when it's structured in a in a good way. Well, this is also the big caveat. If it's not structured in the right way, like documentation can be super confusing, and then uh, it's kind of useless. Um, there's also like an intermediary route, which is going with an ad spec, and I, I put this under documentation first. But um, you can kind of get go for the code documentation mixed approach first, where you look at the NAT spec of the different functions as well as how the code fits together. And this way, uh, how all the classes fit, classes contracts fit together. And this way you get to see like what the intention is of every function, uh, which is a little bit more fine grained than just looking at the high level developer docs. And then, um, let me see. The goal here, again, is build a high level understanding of what it is that people are trying to do with their system. Um, you want to figure out what the core components are. Like if you have um, option, uh, like an options DeFi component, where where is are the where are all the funds kept, or what's the component managing, like the minting of new options, like what are going to be the critical pieces of code that when you look at them, that that's where you want no vulnerabilities. And of course, you want to know like how is the system going to fit together, like what are the different functionalities. Um, and and how do they like the different sub mechanics work together to make the system whole? And one approach I like to take is based on the documentation. I think about like what how would I write code to do what the developers are trained to do. So and then. I think about how difficult it would be to do things right. So if you have like if you have some type of um, DeFi component that has liquidations, for example, liquidations are kind of difficult to do, right? Or like they, they they are very sensitive, and if they are doing like super weird leverage type stuff, then liquidations are a very interesting point to see. Like, hey, what if I can make this break? So I, I actually usually come up with a list of things that I think, you, you know, like this system might be vulnerable to this. And sometimes you can be sure that a system is vulnerable to a particular attack just from reading the documentation because there is no way to that they can implement this right. There's just some ideas that don't work. For example, if they describe like a... Um, let me see, like an AMM design, this just sucks. Like that, like, let's say they propose an AMM design that uses a, a, uh, an Oracle price to swap at. And then you can just like, and the oracles can get slightly out of date and you can arbitrage like the, a lot of money every time the Oracle updates. Uh, and you can just take out all the money of the system. Like there's vulnerabilities like that, that you can just find by reading documentation, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you would also find those if you just read the code, but it's fun to already find them when you when you have the documentation. And then when you have a list of all the pain points, all the, all the things that you might think might go wrong, you go into the code base and just go for each of them and see if they're wrong. And then this is kind of a, one of the fastest ways I found to find the first vulnerability. Um, 
So another interesting approach behind the code by behind the documentation first technique is that you can well, when you look at NetSpec Commons, um, there's a really neat feature in NetSpec that it has the English version of what the function is supposed to be doing. So you can kind of compare what the intention is of the function to the reality. Um, as well as, like I mentioned before, you can get an understanding of the whole contract by just looking uh, of, of what the smart contract or function is supposed to do and also the contract, but just reading uh, that net spec. But then you can compare like the implementation to the intention. Um, and if that's not, if that doesn't match, that probably leads to a vulnerability down the line. Um, but yeah, uh, then these are kind of like like auditing methodologies, like a little bit like auditing methodologies, except they are different. So in Pentesting, like Web2 security, there's a lot more methodologies than you will find in Web3. I, I think there's one one or like auditing methodology for smart contracts, but I'm not sure that many people actually use it. But the core idea behind a lot of these Web2 methodologies is kind of to provide two things. Like they provide a structure for your time. Like you have one, two weeks and you just go through like essentially the methodology, a plan for set things making sure that you spend your time the right way. Um, and methodologies also tend to allow you um, to reach a, like a minimum level of quality. Like they ensure, like if you go through all of these things, you'll at least make sure that you've covered like all your bases. Um, and that tends to be very useful in that space. For software reviews, maybe not that much. Um, We'll see uh, if, if they uh, catch on in the future. Uh, but for now, like uh, experience seems, or the evidence being that not that many people use methodologies like this seems to suggest that they are not necessarily effective. But th the interesting thing is, is that there's this common thread among the approaches that different auditors have. Um, and I think... Uh, but they are different than your traditional methodology. What And what they try to give you, other than what regular methodologies give you, is a good foundation for the rest of your audit. Um, so they are about providing a good start. And the, the common thread among the three common strategies is that they're all about building a mental model first. Like they all start out building a good mental model of the system, whether you start with code first, reading no documentation, whether you start with a bunch of tools generating all the diagrams, or whether you um, whether you started with a documentation. Everything is about getting a really good mental model as fast as possible allowing you to learn about the system as quick as possible and enabling like your problem solving part of your brain in terms of figuring out afterwards when you get into the meat of it, um, what the vulnerabilities in the system might be. And I think uh, there are a few principles um, supporting the these different strategies. explaining why why they are uh, as effective as they are or where they are seemingly effective as they are because everybody is using them. So the first principle is association. So kind of like disclaimer before all this, I'm going to refer to my high level understanding of how some concept way, uh, concepts around neuroscience work, but this is like a high level example with the 
high level understanding of things. I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know how brains work, but I have read a few things and I thought these interesting tidbits uh, are interesting to know and might help you design your own like starting strategy. So the first one is whenever you learn new information, it's not necessarily, it's dumped into your brain, but it's not necessarily easily accessible. So this is why you don't instantly learn things. Um, you, you don't read something and then know everything about it for the rest of your life. You, you got to like go through the material again and again and use it in different things to actually retain the information. But retain isn't really the right word or it seems to not be the right word. It's more about efficient retrieval. So new information that you learn is there in your brain um, for sure, but it, it's not necessarily easily accessible. So what you can, what this means is that if you read a random function in a random smart contract, um, you'll forget about it right away. Like there, or you'll, you'll remember it for sure. But if you then read 20 functions in sequence, you're not going to remember the first after you finish with the 20th. But if you build a really good mental model, uh, like a, a kind of like tree-like structure of the system, and now you learn, read about a new function, um, you can kind of associate this new function with the memory that you already knew. And or like this, this uh, mental model that you already had that's that's well founded in your brain that you spend like one or two days structuring with either of your three approaches. Now that link allows you to to make it more easy to retrieve those memories than if you had no associate nothing to associate them within to start with. So essentially, it becomes easier to remember new things about the code base if you have a good like understanding of what the whole is trying to do and how things fit together, how your new memory fits within what you already know. So essentially, you're becoming more effective with your tech by, by having this starting mental model. The second thing principle is around working memory. And you probably have heard of this before. This is like the magic number seven, where you can hold seven things, about seven things in your brain at one time. Um, and the idea here is like you have different memory models. And one of the ideas is, well, if you have um, things in your brain that you're thinking about, like different numbers, different items that you're trying to fit together, you can hold five or two, seven distinct concepts and reason about them at one time. But if you look at these memory competitions, people can like memorize whole decks of cards all at once. Like they can memorize maybe two decks of cards. I don't know, like at least 50 things, I guess, uh, 52 cards at a time, which is way more than five to seven. And one of the tricks that they use uh, so is called uh, chunking. So essentially they don't remember each distinct card. They make compound memories or chunks. And they put different, like multiple cards in the same kind of image that they then store in their brain. And that way they get to memorize way more cards than they otherwise could have. And you can apply that same concept to thinking about code. So the idea is by, by like using different levels of abstraction. So to put this in a less abstract way, if you're thinking about how like a set of smart contracts works, you can keep like five, you can think about five functions at the same time, maybe. But if you kind of build this associative memory and you can have the idea of a class or a, fun, uh, or a smart contract that's doing a set of different things and you store, like you think about it as a whole with all the different functions functioning as a part of that contract, 
then suddenly you can think about five contracts at the same time. Um, or like this is kind of like a high level thing, but you can think about the system as a whole and you can suddenly reason about five smart contracts at a time, which each have maybe 10 functions. So you're suddenly thinking about or reasoning in your brain about a system with 50 functions where before you were maybe thinking about like part of a smart contract and how it works together. And again, the important thing here is to essentially build that mental model of a smart contract of a function, how it fits within a smart contract and how the smart contract fits within the whole. You allow your brain to see them as the same thing and reason about them as a whole unit. And in that way, it kind of bypass that limitation. And okay, the cognitive bias one we, I kind of talked about in the beginning um, on the uh, on the code first approach. <laughs> There's this problem that people um, tend to look for information that confirms their beliefs. Um, people also have uh, uh, this trick or that their brain plays on them where if they see one thing that confirms like something they were looking for, like their brain shuts up for a bit and they just miss anything else. So uh, like what might happen is you find one, you have read a function, uh, you find one bug in the beginning of the function and then you're so excited about that one bug, you kind of miss the other bug that's further on in the function that can happen for sure. Um, and so the idea here is that uh, it's important to be aware that your brain kind of plays these tricks on you and is optimized to do things in a way that's not always efficient as an auditor. So one of the ways this can happen is if you read documentation and expect some parts of the code to adhere to that, what the documentation is saying. <laughs> Another is, and, and this is why I think audit, like it's always important to have a fresh set of eyes on anything, is that once you've read certain piece of code once, once you have built a mental model, if the mental model is inaccurate, you kind of gloss over the code and never notice that your your mental model is inaccurate. And this this happens for anyone, and it's a very efficient thing because you can't reread and retry to understand the code all the time, but it's a pitfall. So it's important to challenge like your assumptions every once in a while to make sure that they're actually true. So one way this might actually happen is if you're like, if you have a, an idea about something like some vulnerability and then you actually look at it and then you think like, oh, you know, like the developers had this mitigation. I think it's actually not possible. Ask yourself, is it really not possible? Like, how could I maybe circumvent this? And then you might find out that it's been possible all along. And that either that mitigation didn't exist or that that mitigation didn't work. Um, I've had both. Uh, or I've also had the inverse where I assumed something was vulnerable and turned out not to be because there was um, a mitigation that the documentation said didn't was there, but they actually did introduce because they, the developers were actually aware of the vulnerability. So I had written up a whole report for nothing uh, because it wasn't vulnerable. In figuring that out, I did find another vulnerability because, well, the documentation and the code didn't match. So I guess the developers made a mistake in another place, also maybe due to this cognitive bias. Um, all right, so there's this other principle called top of mind. So there's this really nice article, I believe, by Paul Graham um, that describes this, but uh, this is really a, like a very old concept. It's the idea that when you are not actively working on something, your brain is still kind of working on things in the background like uh, i believe they call the default mode network is still like doing things it's it's still churning and figuring things out like you're cleaning you're doing the dishes you're under the shower like i'm trying to sleep sometime and then my brain is like yo 
there's this vulnerability in this code, you gotta wake up. Um, which was, I mean, so it's kind of nice if you find the vulnerability and if it's true, but uh, sleep is also nice. Uh, I personally think sleep is great. Um, so this is kind of like, I have mixed feelings about this one, but it's been one of the most effective like mental tools I've had to have this like space for your brain um, to work on things. And there's two important things to make sure that this works. The first one you will achieve by doing all of the methods that like that people do. It's building a good mental model of the whole system so that your brain has that mental model while it's turning away. So here's why you need this. If you only read like half of the code base, you read contract by contract, line by line, you go like spend a day per contract and you've like at one point you're halfway in the code base and uh, maybe your brain is like passively thinking through one exploit scenario. Um, I don't know how subconscious kind of think about things, but it will be thinking through things. And then it hits a block when there is a function call to a smart contract that you haven't really read yet. And it will not be able to continue. What's much better is if you have a high level understanding of how the whole system works, you kind of iteratively fill in the details by reading bits and pieces and clicking around. And your passive thinking, even though it doesn't have all the information, it has the global idea of how everything fits together and how everything is supposed to fit together. And it can kind of run with abstractions, like those high level understandings that you already have of how, what the different functions and contracts do and guarantee. The other is making sure that you have one thing on top of your mind, not too many things. So unfortunately, this isn't always easy, like life happens, but um, don't try to do too many things at once, I guess. Like don't try to bug hunt on or audit multiple smart like code bases at the same time, because you'll be wasting like this focus or this extra time because like, uh, or you'll be only spending this extra time on one thing. Uh, one of the examples from the article that I mentioned, so this is a, an investor, is that they noticed that they were incredibly unproductive while they were trying to raise funds. Um, not necessarily, they weren't necessarily spending less time working on like, real things. It's just that their top of mind time was spent figuring out how to raise funds rather than how to build new things. And um, yeah, so this is why they started limiting, I think, how much they were raising or like they they, they changed things such that they weren't looking for funds all the time. I don't remember. The, the core idea is make sure that you have this extra time where your brain can just churn when you do the dishes and everything and that it works on the right things uh and not the wrong things cool um so this all applies to audits and i mostly talk to auditors but um i also do bounty hunting and i thought it would be interesting to reflect on how these different approaches apply to bounty hunting so with bounty hunting, the goal is, so with auditing, your goal is to set the team that you're working with up for success for trading the most secure smart contracts ever. Like you want to try to find all the vulnerabilities and you want to give them the best recommendations about how they can improve like the state of their code base. With bounty hunting, it's way different. Your goal is to optimize time to revenue or enjoyment, uh, but it's difficult to optimize for enjoyment, um, uh, at least with, with strong metrics. Anyways, so to optimize for time to revenue, I feel like there's two main strategies. Like you go quick and high level, you go for the things that you think are vulnerable uh, and you go out, or you go deep for that, like the hardcore thing. And I think the strategies that are described apply very much to both. Um, so in the, in 
the quick strategy like you want to find as many like the main vulnerabilities as fast as possible if there's if you have a feeling that there's nothing you go out the most important thing is that you build a fast understanding of the system and that you build a list of the main pain points that you think are going to be vulnerable uh exactly what it described about how like the the documentation first approach kind of helps you do things uh you go in read the documentation get an understanding of how the system fits together what it's supposed to do figure out where the developers likely messed up you look at those locations and see if they actually did if they didn't you go to the next project um and mind you this is like one of the strategies you could take it's I'm, I'm not saying anything about it being the most efficient one but to do this approach efficiently it's important to build that steady base get that fast understanding build that mental model and find the critical points to check um the deep strategy is different. You have a lot of time in this case, um, and it's most important to build a deep understanding. But again, to build that deep understanding, it's very, like, it's incredibly useful and important to build that high level mental model and understanding of the whole system. And so that you can kind of memorize everything, put everything together, and then get that insane understanding of the system that the developers don't even have to find the vulnerabilities that nobody thought of. And um, yeah, so like for those things, also starting uh, with one of the approaches, either, either one of the three um, is, is going to be insanely useful. So takeaway, I mean, there's one very cliche takeaway good start is half the battle but there's one other thing that i haven't talked about yet or said um which i think is an interesting detail most of the auditors that i spoke to had one of the three strategies as the first thing they do but 80 or 90 percent of them did a variant of all three combined so they would start out doing one and then kind of follow the others. So they would read the documentation, build the high level model, build the list of pain points, and then run all the tools. Or and then and then after they ran the tools, built the diagrams, they would look at the code and follow the approach of like of building a high level model of the code base from the code perspective and seeing if it matched what they understood from the documentation or the other way around uh, like people that start with blind auditing would run all the tools afterwards read the documentation afterwards and it also get, like this allows you to fill the gaps of the, like the weaknesses of each different approach and also like it provides some additional things because you can now compare like your understanding from the different perspectives and where things don't match, like where the documentation doesn't match the implementation is generally gonna be a really interesting point to look at uh, because, well, technically if the code doesn't match the documentation, that's a bug already. Um, now you might not be able to steal money because of it, but in a lot of cases, you might be able to trigger some other scenario that allows you to, to steal a lot of money. Um, all right, so that's kind of it. Um, you can find me on Twitter at this handle. Uh, my name is super easy. Uh, and uh, I think we have time for, for a few questions. Yeah, we definitely do.